All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the September 3rd Thursday Web Forum. My name is Hillary Morris. Uh, I work on Blueprint User Support and Communications for the South Atlantic LCC. I know most of you all are familiar with the overall format of these calls, but in case we have anybody joining us for the first time, uh, your cooperative hosts this web forum every third Thursday of the month at 10 a.m., and it serves as a chance for folks to ask questions and provide input to help guide the conservation future of the South Atlantic. So we usually have a presentation discussing current and ongoing work throughout the cooperative, which can range from updates on funded projects to indicator and blueprint updates to relevant research on conservation planning and global change and more. So every forum has roughly the same agenda. I'll start out by introducing our presenter, who will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then following the presentation, there'll be time for questions. And we'll spend the rest of the webinar on updates from South Atlantic LCC staff followed by an open discussion. Um, so before I hand things off to the team from the American Planning Association who's joining us today, just a few logistics. Um, to minimize background noise, I'm going to mute everybody during the presentation. So if you have questions, please just type them directly into the chat box, which I'll be monitoring, or you can hold them until after the presentation. Uh, and I think we may be pausing briefly for questions in the middle of the talk as well. So if you do use the chat box and want everyone to be able to read the question during the discussion, just remember to send the note to everybody. You can change the recipient from that little drop-down menu uh, in the chat box. So. Uh, and to speak at any time, all you need to do is to press star six to unmute yourself. So before I put us all on mute, does anybody want to speak up with questions, comments, or concerns? The conference is now in silent mode. All right. So presenting today, we have David Rouse, Jennifer Hennigan, and Anna Reed with the American Planning Association, or APA. And they're going to be talking to us about how planners and conservationists are working together to bridge their professions in a collaborative project between the South Atlantic LCC and the APA. So we're going to learn how APA is working to integrate local government, green and blue infrastructure efforts with regional infrastructure approaches like the Conservation Blueprint. And we'll get a sneak preview of next week's South Atlantic Urban Conservation Summit that's being held in Atlanta on September 21st and 22nd. Um, so David uh, is going to kick us off. So David, I'm going to go ahead and pass presenter power to you, um, and then you can go ahead and share your PowerPoint application. So you should have the power. And uh, so you can go ahead and share and just remember star six to unmute. Great, I can see your slides. So um, if you would just. Yep, thank you, Hillary. I, I, I hope everyone can hear me now. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Uh, again, thanks, Hillary. Uh, this is uh, David Rouse. I'm the research director for the American Planning Association. And I'm joined by my colleagues. Uh, Anna Reed is actually with me here in our DC office. Jennifer Hennigan is in Chicago through the power of, uh, of webinars. And I'm going to kick us off and followed by Jennifer and Anna. And then we'll have questions and discussion, as Hillary said. I just wanted to make one uh, comment about the title of our presentation and our project, actually, Urban Conservation Thinking Mega Regionally. Uh, the concept of mega regions, if you're familiar with it, is generally applied to clusters or what are sometimes called agglomerations of metropolitan areas that can span several states. So the, the best uh, known example is the megalopolis uh, region in the Northeast. And what's really interesting about this project for us, and we're doing work on mega regions elsewhere, is that really the South Atlantic LCC and the blueprint is mega regional in scale. It, it covers parts of five or six states but from a conservation perspective rather than an urban development perspective. So we're kind of stretching the scales of how we generally think about these things. So moving on, um, this is what we're going to talk about. Again, I'm going to talk about sort of set the stage, the introduction, talk about the project uh, purpose and scope. I do want to cover the topic of green infrastructure, which is at the core of our work. It's really a refresher since I know uh, most or all of you are familiar with the uh, concept. I do want to talk about it. At that point, we'll pause for some questions. And then the first bit of work that we've done, preparatory work, has been we've been going through a series of interviews with folks from the conservation community and the planning community within the overall LCC area. So 
very interesting findings, and that's what Jennifer and Anna are going to review. And then we're going to have some discussion, open up for questions. And we also have some questions for, uh, to, from you that hopefully will provoke some thought and discussion. Uh, so moving on, uh, the project purpose. And this is from our scope of work, examine how large-scale green infrastructure definitions uh, and urban-scale green infrastructure definitions can be bridged and identify areas of shared conservation interest across a rural urban continuum. There seems to be a little glitch in that sentence. However, the idea is looking at how you bridge urban and rural conservation across, um, you know, across disciplines in particular, and particularly how do you engage uh, and connect urban planners to the, to the blueprint and conservation uh, professionals in the overall mega region moving forward. So that's what we're, that's what the purpose of our project is. The scope, you know, there are about five steps we're going to go through to over about a 15-month process. The first is to identify opportunities and challenges related to urban conservation. So we've done the interviews. We will be having the Urban Conservation Summit next week. Uh, the next is to develop an approach based on this and research we've done to improve the blueprint design in or near in the near cities. Uh, work with the LCC to test the approach. Does this work? And with with some of the stakeholders we're engaging. Uh, very important is to recommend improvements to the urban open space and related indicators for urban areas, and then we'll have a, a final report and recommendations that come out of that process. So let me um, just spend a few minutes talking about green infrastructure, um, and I'm taking this opportunity to actually put a plug in for a publication that I co-wrote for APA with my co former colleague, uh, Ignacio Bunster, a few years ago called Green Infrastructure, a Landscape Approach. You know, my particular background is as a planning practitioner, and I'm trained as a landscape architect. So for me, green infrastructure is a concept that cut, it cuts across disciplines and scales of practice, uh, and that's really what's laid out in this report and that APA published. And I'm, what I'm going to sort of go over quickly in the next few slides, just to give kind of a perspective of where we're coming from for this project. So let me start with the definitions. And there are really two definitions of green infrastructure that are commonly used. The first is from the conservation profession, the idea of this large-scale network of open space, parks, greenways, natural areas at larger scales, the scale of the city or metropolitan region. The second definition, which is somewhat newer and has really been uh, uh, promoted by EPA, uh, it's, it's more commonly used in urban areas, and it's basically green stormwater uh, management practices that use vegetation, soil, and permeable surfaces to absorb runoff close to where it's generated. So the top definition is from the Conservation Fund, uh, Mark Benedict and Ed McMahon's work, and the bottom is from, e it's from the Environmental Protection Agency. And it's always good to, I like to put some, you know, tangible examples of what this means across scales. Again, the idea of thinking of across scales. Uh, really, there's no, there are those two definitions, but again, it's a continuum. There's not really a sharp differentiation between them. So this continuum extends across scales from the region to city, district, neighborhood, and site. So some examples. The top is actually an image from uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, the Plainsect farmland, uh, working farms and forests. Uh, the middle is also in Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia. I spent a lot of time there, so we'll see some images from Pennsylvania. This is uh, Penn Park in Philadelphia. And down at the bottom is actually New York City, getting down to the city scale, looking at things like uh, uh, urban parks, parkways, and boulevards. And the urban forest is really a, 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 a defining element of green infrastructure at that, at that city and urban scale. So stepping down in scale to the uh, neighborhood scale, local parks, constructed wetlands, green streets, uh, the top is actually, again, in Philadelphia is an image of a constructed stormwater wetland in Philadelphia Park, uh, in a Philadelphia Park, part of their green infrastructure program, a green street. You know, a, a question I might pose is, can green street be a, streets be a form of conservation and under what circumstances and how do you define that? 
uh, and then down to the scale of the site, uh, or even building with a green roof being an example. Uh, now, what we'd like to say unifies this concept of green infrastructure across these different scales uh, of concern is the idea of co-benefits, and particularly the triple bottom line, environmental, economic, and social. And I always like to, like to make the reminder that the original triple bottom line equity is the third E and is incredibly important, but it, when you talk about sustainability, this is a triple bottom line of sustainability that sometimes gets forgotten or not as addressed as, as, as other, uh, other, you know, other concerns. And particularly in public health, is this an issue? Um, you can see star, stark disparities in health outcomes. Uh, between rich and poor neighborhoods in the same city as much as 20 years or more. So there is really an equity issue, which I think is central and which we're trying to address through a series of projects and in green infrastructure. So again, some of these images, the top is sort of typifying the environmental aspect. It's a bioretention basin in Philadelphia, absorbing and treating stormwater, providing habitat. The middle is the idea of, of economic benefits. Green infrastructure can provide uh, jobs. And down at the bottom is a trail in actually Prince George's County, Maryland, illustrating the idea of public health benefits, outdoor recreation and contact with nature, which can uh, be very important and studies have shown to public health. So let's just go through these uh, one at a time in a little more depth. Uh, uh, green infrastructure is perhaps best known for the environmental benefits it provides, uh, which are also uh, referred to in ecological terms and ecosystem uh, services. So here's a, some of them listed, absorbing stormwater, improving air and water quality, moderate, moderating the local climate, reducing the urban heat island effect, uh, maintaining that native habitat and lessening energy conservation, uh, mitigating climate change. So a lot can be accomplished by green infrastructure. There was actually one study found in Baltimore, Maryland parks the temperatures were as much as five degrees Fahrenheit cooler in the afternoon and 13 degrees Fahrenheit cooler at night than in the surrounding parts of Baltimore downtown. So that's a significant effect. Moving on to the economic co-benefits, uh, this slide shows some of the benefits at the local economic uh, scale provided by green infrastructure in American cities. And much of this has been documented by, re by research. Uh, for example, a study found that businesses on streets with trees had 12% higher income streams than those along streets without trees, that people were attracted to a retail area with, uh, with trees. And uh, down at the bottom is actually from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, is the idea of ecotourism, which is a very large part of the green infrastructure plan that they prepared a, a few years back. So finally, and this is my last slide before we... Um, pause for questions and then get into the interviews that uh, results that, that, that uh, Jennifer and Anna will go over. It's the idea of social, uh, social slash equity co-benefits, providing outdoor recreation opportunities, which, which again connect to health, um, improving environmental quality for people and wildlife, and that's part of the social connection, providing places for people to meet. Very important. Uh, uh, to aesthetics and sense of place, connecting uh, people to nature, and not to forget that green infrastructure can yield locally uh, produced resources, such as food, fiber, and water. So I'm going to stop there, and I think we're going to uh, pause to see if anyone has any questions or comments on anything I've covered so far before we get into the interviews results. Yeah, thanks, David. Just star six to unmute. Uh, feel free to use the chat box. We'll pause here for a second. All right, hearing none. Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to pass presenter power over to you um, so you can share your slides. All right, can everybody hear me now? Loud and clear. All right, and hopefully you're seeing my slides. Yep. Very good, all right. Well, um, thank you, David and Hillary. Um, so, 
as part of this project, next week we're going to be having a summit of people uh, who are looking at this issue on the conservation side and on the planning side. To inform the discussion at that summit, we did interviews with 24 people on both sides as well as a few folks who didn't fall neatly into the uh, one category or the other of planners or conservationists, um, people with titles like sustainability director and that sort of thing. And the opening icebreaker question that we asked everyone was, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you assess your involvement in urban conservation issues? Uh, the conservationists, uh, perhaps not unexpectedly, uh, averaged a 7.5 that uh, most of them are very involved. Um, not everyone, though, since some of the people that we spoke with deal more in rural areas, but everyone was somewhere on the scale uh, with some sort of involvement in urban conservation. The planners in the survey, uh, on the other hand, uh, came in only at a five, which I think is, not, again, not, uh, not very surprising as conservation for most of them is a small part of their many different job responsibilities. So uh, I'm going to talk about the interviews with the conservationists and then uh, once I've finished, then Anna Reed will jump in to talk about her interviews with people on the planning side. Uh, this was a very interesting group of people in the conservation world, and uh, they were coming at conservation from many different, many different places, uh, since you had some organizations that were focused on coastal issues, whereas others were um, rural forested areas, so there's a lot of diversity in terms of the makeup of the organizations and what their focuses are. However, there were some common goals that were identified here. Uh, one is sustainability, uh, often in terms of encouraging sustainable development within urban areas. Biological diversity was uh, a very, very common goal. Uh, working towards resiliency and adaptation and then protecting floodplains, wetlands, and endangered species and their habitats. Uh, those four goals uh, were common to most, if not all, of the conservation organizations that we spoke with. And uh, some of the questions that we had asked were looking at if, uh, what strategies they have found to be effective to mitigate development in uh, areas where development of housing and businesses has already occurred. And the most effective strategy that was identified there was zoning, having uh, official regulations in place that would preserve conservation areas. Um, and then closely related to that uh, would be tax incentives, giving some sort of financial benefit to, for developers to conserve. Uh, another effective strategy was encouraging quality development, getting back to that issue of sustainability uh, with high density, good connectivity to tra uh, with transportation, and also looking at conservation design. Uh, the fourth uh, most effective strategy mentioned was multi-use conservation areas. And then number five was interesting, um, showing the economic value of conservation. And I'll get a little more into that later with the uh, with my summary of this area, but that's showing the economic value to developers as well as to landowners and elected officials. Then a very similar question was looking at what strategies are effective to limit development in those areas where development has not already occurred. And far and away, the most popular or most recommended strategy was land acquisition, getting that, uh, those conservation areas under, under control so that they can be protected. Uh, another very popular but uh, less effective strategy were conservation easements, simply because they offer less control for con conserving that land. But then also another strategy was public education, which many of the people that we spoke with said was key to get people informed about why conservation is important uh, so that they will support those zoning restrictions 
taxes to fund conservation and generally using public money towards conservation um, that were those strategies that were viewed as being so effective in urban areas. And another component of public education is marketing or branding an area to give an identity that people can start to uh, start to hold on to and say, yeah, this place means something to me, which, again, will make them more likely to support those zoning restrictions and taxes that would allow the areas to be conserved. And then we also asked people, what strategies do they see out there that aren't so effective? And uh, one that came up quite often was ignoring urban areas, which um, some of the conservationists that we spoke with said is, is something that does tend to happen since most of the land that they deal with is undeveloped. Um, it, it can be easy to ignore the importance of urban and developed areas, but that is uh, obviously not a good long-term strategy there. Uh, another ineffective strategy identified was speaking to the choir. If you're only talking to like-minded individuals or those who generally support conservation, you're uh, leaving people uh, away from the table who really should be there. You need to get those who aren't already sold on the concept in order to get that broad-based public support that's necessary to implement zoning and financial incentives on a municipal level. Um, also, one thing that several people mentioned was uh, having guidelines rather than mandates is not nearly as effective as having a legal regulation where people are required to conserve land. Uh, they may be a little, guidelines may be a little more friendly, but the conservationists we spoke to said that mandates are much more effective at actually getting that done. And then um, also uh, number four, regulations without complementary incentives or education. Um, they're uh, simply not that effective unless people have a reason to support those regulations, be that financial or having some sort of uh, emotional or general understanding of the importance of conservation. And uh, in the challenges, uh, we had asked people what, what do they find are the challenges to uh, conservation in urban areas, and those fell mainly into two categories, coordination and education. Under coordination, one of the items was unclear conservation objectives, uh, people not really being sure what or why they were conserving the areas they were being told to look at. Um, also, another uh, key problem was a lack of regional links, uh, looking uh, at conservation projects sort of in a bubble, where you'd have a successful small conservation area in a park or something like that, but if it's not linking up to something larger, some sort of regional network, the benefits are much, much lower than if you're providing a habitat corridor or something like that. And uh, related is uncoordinated planning um, with conservation agencies and uh, local planning agencies not really working together and getting on the same page as to what their conservation goals are and how they could work together. Uh, then with education, this is something that, uh, as I've mentioned previously, kept coming up, um, is so important to getting people on all sides to support conservation initiatives, um, having the time and the ability to engage stakeholders. Many of the organizations that we spoke with don't have a large staff. And so really uh, the education component that they'd like to do, they simply don't have the time or the budget to, to devote to that. Um, developer and landowner education is key to getting people to want to conserve. And then uh, related to that is the political appetite for con conservation. Passing laws and ordinances is one thing, but they need to be strongly supported in order for them to be upheld so that people aren't getting variations uh, to, to waive conservation requirements and make sure that they are held in place for the long term. And so with that, I will turn it over to Anna Reed to talk about what she found in her interviews with people in the planning side. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, David, I'm, I'm passing the ball back to you and Anna. So uh, 
feel free to go ahead and share. Share application PowerPoint. Yeah. And then you're going to have to jump forward to. Do I do the stall okay. six? Yeah. Sorry, just jumping forward on this version of the PowerPoint here. No problem. <laughs> um, okay. Here so we, go. we talked to um, planners or reached out to planners and ended up talking to 12 planners, uh, two stormwater engineers, and a parks professional with seven local and four regional planning agencies in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Oops. Sorry, here. Just Passing the mouse <laughs> back and forth. Can you just hit on your keyboard? Okay. Um, and they identified uh, their goals. And while in identifying conservation goals for their communities, they did address water quality, stormwater management, uh, preservation of tree canopy, um, and general land conservation. Um, as well as sea level rise and habitat prevention. The emphasis was on um, economic benefits and quality life, quality of life and livability, um, and the general community benefits that can come from conservation. So how is conservation addressed in communities? Um, most of the planners said that it was included in an element of a comprehensive plan uh, addressing goals and policies, often in the environment element, the parks and open space, or um, in addressing farmland preservation, which was uh, noted as a priority in many of the communities. Um, it's also addressed in functional plans, uh, in a few cases in standalone green infrastructure plans, but throughout the um, interviews, green waste plans and green waste systems were emphasized as a major way that conservation is addressed in the communities and something that has significant public support. Um, there's also a lot of mapping of green infrastructure conservation lands that's been completed, um, but what has been included in these layers differs somewhat from planning agency to planning agency, um, though most of them do use the integrated definition that David addressed during um, his comments at the beginning that looks at both conservation features and green stormwater uh, infrastructure. Um, local planning agencies use a number of regulatory tools to address um, conservation. These include um, floodplain ordinances, stormwater regulations, uh, tree protection ordinances, um, to some extent cluster conservation subdivisions, and then a number were using um, density bonuses as well. And then there are programs and incentives. Um, these include technical assistance. Um, in the form of toolkits as well as in the form of hands-on assistance, financial assistance, and then also partnerships um, with local organizations for things like rain barrel programs or tree planting programs. So there are a number of different ways that communities are addressing um, conservation through their plans, through their regulatory tools, and with programs and incentives. Um, and a number of local government departments are engaged um, planning uh, public works and stormwater, uh, specifically the stormwater management and engineering divisions, uh, parks and recreation, transportation. Um, fire and emergency services came up several times because with green stormwater infrastructure, there's a lot of concern about maneuvering um, emergency vehicles. So that's one that um, was a little bit of a surprise um, how actively it's involved, um, and then also it's it's a lot of space that um, communities are looking to put projects on uh, emergency services facilities, so green roofs or green stormwater infrastructure. And then GIS, which in some of the um, agencies we talked to is a standalone department and some is a division, but obviously is actively involved in the um, mapping of green infrastructure conservation features within a uh, planning jurisdiction. And then, there are a number of other partners. Uh, interviews emphasize that they partner with a wide range of groups um, and work with different groups on different priorities. Um, so local land trusts and conservancies um, were frequently cited, as well as riverkeeper organizations, uh, trail groups, particularly the Carolina Thread Trail, which came up uh, numerous times in the conversation, local universities and extension programs, and state departments of um, environment or natural resources. Um, and actually, um, there was some emphasis that particularly in rural communities, there's a lot of 
trust for the state um, departments of natural resources or whichever department issues hunting licenses, so they're really great partners in those communities where there can be some challenges addressing these, um, these issues. So one of the major challenges that was emphasized again and again was that this is a really high growth area of the country. Um, a number of the interviews were able to cite the sort of number of people moving to their community a day um, and that those growth pressures uh, really create a challenge uh, in addressing conservation. Um, they also emphasize that um, private property or land owner rights are very strong in the southeast and that that can make uh, addressing conservation and green infrastructure through regulation a real challenge. Um, funding availability came up time and again. They may want to do something, but there may not be money available. And then also, um, sometimes there is money available, but then when it goes away, the project kind of comes to a halt. Um, general awareness and understanding, which is something Jennifer touched on as well. Um, so how to make people aware of why conservation needs to be addressed, how it ties into other community benefits, um, and not just uh, community members, but also local government staff. And then political will, which again, Jennifer also addressed, um, not just not being there, but also that there can be kind of an ebb and flow to the political will, so it can be very strong, and then another issue can take precedence. And then finally, a lack of capacity in small rural communities. Um, which can create challenges for addressing um, issues in those communities. So um, in terms of communicating conservation effectively, um, interviews emphasize talking to communities about their priorities or things that are really valued by community members. And so again, those economic benefits, the livability and quality of life and the recreation and to some extent transportation benefits, uh, particularly when you're looking at greenways came up. Um, and then starting small, so pilot projects or small projects and building support and momentum um, into a bigger project or network um, was also emphasized. And then finding advocates uh, both within, so that sort of champion city council member or something, and outside of local government. Um, so one interview we talked about a local mountain bike group that really really wanted better trails, and so that group being a great advocate for some of the work they were doing. Um, so those were some of the, the key takeaways on sort of communicating effectively um, and, and overcoming some of those challenges. And then finally, sorry, um, just a couple key takeaways from the interviews. Um, Multi-benefit approach is, is really key. Um, there are a lot of different competing priorities that local and regional planning agencies are dealing with, and conservation and green infrastructure is competing with those priorities, so focusing on a multi-benefit approach can show that conservation and green infrastructure can be a tool for achieving those goals, and it can connect it to those other priority issues. Um, as always, there's a need for more funding to support green infrastructure and conservation. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes there's funding for a program and people will get really engaged around the issue or that particular program, but when the funding source goes away, um, the issue can become much lower priority. Um, and interdepartmental collaboration is really key, um, and this includes, um, you know, between departments, between departments and regional planning agencies, and also uh, partnerships and coalitions with local land trusts and, and um, conservancies to achieving conservation goals. And then regulatory approaches really can be a challenge in these areas with um, strong land owner rights. Interviewees um, emphasize that incentives can help achieve conservation um, priorities. And then just one final thing is that a number of interviewees um, said that they really don't have a lot of specific indicators at this point on um, how they measure the success of conservation or green infrastructure in their jurisdictions, but just implementing those projects is considered to be a success or a measure of success. Um, so those are kind of the, the key takeaways from the interviews with planners. So I think we'll... Yeah, 
Oops, could you back up? Actually, before we go there, this is David again. I just wanted to say a couple words. Uh, we're, we're at the end of our presentation. We're going to move into the discussion. But just it was interesting listening to Jennifer and Anna and thinking about there are some, definitely some common themes here. Um, uh, land acquisition is being most effective uh, means of protection. On the other hand, when you get into urban areas, it doesn't work as well because the res obviously the resources aren't as, as intact, so there are different strategies that are that are needed there. One thing that actually jumped out at me was that the conservation uh, professionals were really emphasizing the power of, of, of mandates, zoning, uh, for example, to to protect resources. We're on the planning side, and I, you know, I know this as a planner. Oftentimes, it's not as easy. There are private property issues, so planners like to say, you know, provide incentives and look for other approaches to do that. And then on both sides, I saw really, and I I, I did a few of these interviews. I saw a real interest in connecting and working sort of across, uh, you know, across you know, professional communities. So uh, conservation, the conservation professionals really thought it was important to work with planners, vice versa. But the interesting thing about planners, and this will be my last comment before we go into, uh, into uh, the discussion, is the planners, you know, they're working in a political environment context. They generally all really like conservation, but they oftentimes need to guise it and achieve it through other things. So they're through the political process. So if they're regulatory drivers, say in stormwater management, for example, that's an opportunity. Uh, so they have to look for ways to achieve conservation when it's, a, when it's part of, you know, goals that a city council or, or, or whoever might have. So those are just a few of, uh, of my observations. I thought they were a great uh, bunch of interviews. And thanks, Jennifer and Anna, for doing that great summary. So. We're now at the, we're just about where we should be in terms of time, so we're now uh, going to open up for questions and discussion and certainly ask us the questions you may have, but we thought we would just sort of seed this a little bit by putting a few questions for you to think about, and if not, respond now. Think about between now and the summit, uh, for them to Hillary, come to the summit and discuss them, to, but the, they're related to what we just went over. So the first is, what, what have been your most significant challenges in implementing conservation projects in urban areas? And the flip side of that is what do you see as the most pro promising opportunities to do this, to, to implement conservation in urban areas? And finally, how can conservation professionals and planners work together to address these challenges and take advantage of the opportunities? So I will stop there and, and, and turn it over to uh, Hillary, and hopefully we can get some good discussion going. Thanks, David. While folks ruminate on those great discussion questions, challenges, opportunities, uh, strategies for working together, we do have a question from Greg Wathen that came through on the chat box. He's asking if there are best practices guidelines for achieving green infrastructure conservation um, or good examples in the southeast United States where the governance structure of a particular local community really lent itself to good green infrastructure conservation outcomes. So I think any of the three of y'all from APA that wanted to take a stab at that, that would be great. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, you know, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think in the southeast. I know Atlanta has done a lot of work on green infrastructure over the years. I was actually involved in some planning they did uh, maybe five to ten years ago. You know, again, I mentioned Philadelphia earlier. That was one that I'm familiar with, which is really advanced uh, green infrastructure is considered a, uh, a leader in this. And it's really, they used a, what, what's, what's called the one water approach with a water department leading this in, in terms of thinking about managing water as an integrated resource in terms of supply, treatment, um, and stormwater management, and the, the whole city lined up behind that, and so planning was involved, the, the, the mayor supported it, the sustainability plan. So that's an example of an integrated approach um, uh, to advanced green infrastructure. And there's, there are plenty more examples and practices out there probably don't have time to get into now, but uh, we can certainly follow up. I don't know if Anna, you have anything to add, or, or Jennifer? 
the, the, uh, actually, I'll ask that. Uh, it's a good question. Anna, you, you interviewed some planners. Did you, did you run across any other jurisdictions that were particularly progressive in this area? Um, I think the Atlanta Regional Commission is doing a lot. Obviously, they're a regional planning agency so that they, they don't have um, really a lot of regulatory tools at their disposal. Um, but they have a regional resource plan and have been working actively in conservation um, since the 1960s. Um, and, you know, how they've prioritized conservation then has changed from a, a um, land acquisition and protection um, approach to uh, more of a, how you use any remnant space in, in the Atlanta region at, at this point. So I think, I think that's probably a good example within the southeast of both um, sort of a long-term um, planning strategy and then also a um, one that's adapted as the region has, has changed. Yeah, I'm actually going to say one more thing here because Anna and I were talking before the webinar about North Carolina and how there seems to be a lot of uh, great greenway uh, uh, examples and greenway planning, which actually goes back, some of you may know, uh, Chuck Flink, who's based in North Carolina, Greenway Zinc, he's now part of another firm, but for several decades he's been promoting the idea of greenways, and there are just some great examples of greenway, greenway uh, trail, uh, trail networks in, in, in you know, places like Raleigh, Cary, other, other places in Charlotte. Like Charlotte and North Carolina. And you know, the greenways is interesting. If you think about it, going back to what I start out with, the idea of co-benefits, so you stretch the greenway idea beyond just being about trails, but being about resources, connectors through the landscape that can provide conservation and other benefits. That's, a, I think, a powerful concept that seems to have really resonated in the Carolinas anyway. Yeah, I can maybe speak to that a little bit just um, as a resident of the Raleigh area and of Wake County. Um, you know, you, you guys talked a good bit about political will and the importance of, of educating the public so that they can really advocate for, the, for conservation benefits. In Wake County, we've got a really strong open space conservation initiative that was funded through a bond referendum. Um, and if I remember right, it was about $50 million that went toward land protection, and a strong goal of that program was water quality. Um, and so that was kind of one of those co-benefit stacks that was able to be done to leverage that funding. Um, and there's also strong uh, watershed buffer protections uh, in this area of the triangle. Um, so, so water quality was a strong way to get conservation support uh, from the community and, and implement those types of policies. Um, another question coming from the chat box from Virginia Dale, how useful is valuation of ecosystem benefits in moving forward? So I guess kind of an ecosystem services quantification approach, did that come up? Um, do you see that as a good way to support urban conservation? I, again, I'll, I'll pitch in on this since we've got the uh, microphone here. I think absolutely, and I'd like to see that advance more because, when, again, if you're in a political environment, uh, decision makers, you know, they want, they show me the money, you know, what is this worth? So I always talk about how do you monetize green infrastructure. So the first step in doing that is if you can, it, you know, it, our society likes to put dollar values on everything. So if you can actually show the value, um, and demonstrate it through, you know, ecosystem service evaluations. I think that's really important. The next step beyond that in my mind, and uh, I'm not sure how to do this, but there are people that are working on it, is then how do you, what I call, you know, I, I call monetize those benefits. In other words, create income streams out of them. And then that would really be powerful. Great. Definitely keep the questions coming, and if you want to respond to any of those discussion questions up on the screen, feel free. Um, keep using the chat box or star six to unmute. Hey, Hillary, this is Greg Wathen. Um, I wanted to... Uh, comment on the second question, the most promising opportunities. It was sort of brought up, I think, through a couple of the of the comments just before, but this this whole water quality issue, I think, is the one 
integrating factor that's going to be the most important driver of conservation, both in the urban, but, but both connecting that urban to their rural landscape uh, uh, interface there. And, you know, it seems to me as we look throughout the southeast, we, we continue to see that, that issue being being just kind of the number one issue on most people's minds and doesn't matter where they're from is water quality. And I'm really interested in learning more about the uh, uh, these bond initiatives and other initiatives in Raleigh, North Carolina, and how that governance was set up to do that kind of thing. So I think that sounds like a really good example for how we could build that out through the southeast. So that's my that's what I see as the most promising opportunity as we move forward with that. Thank you. Can I comment on that quickly? Because I agree. And the other thing is there's an alignment with, uh, you know, uh, uh, mandates. Again, mandates, zoning as planners will tell you are tough, but there's some, you know, strong mandates for water quality at, at the federal and state level that are regulatory drivers. So uh, you, when you have that sort of, backing thing, you know, that contributing to the motivation to address some of these water quality through, you know, uh, green infrastructure approaches, I think that makes it even more promising. Greg, this is Hillary. If you if you want to talk offline a little bit more about about Wake and Raleigh examples, um, I'd be happy to do that in the South Atlantic. We've, we've worked a little bit with that Wake County Open Space Advisory Committee and, and Louise Vaughn, my counterpart on user support, um, has some strong relationships with that group. So we could chat about that more. Sounds good. I've already written myself a note to contact Perfect. you about it. <laughs> and actually, Adam Tarando with the Southeast Climate Science Center um, is, is pretty familiar with that as well. So All right. I'll to rope into that conversation. Um, anybody else want to weigh in on these discussion questions or ask ask any clarifying questions? We we definitely have at least five more minutes for conversation, so keep them coming. This is John Faustini. Um, uh, on 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 number two, as far as opportunities, I mean, I think in in a broad sense, one of the things I see is that um, as an opportunity is is the the move uh, certainly here in, in the Atlanta metro area um, to attract uh, millennials. And and the the, the at least perceived uh, desire of millennials to have you know live in walkable neighborhoods and and uh, it's really promoting um, in, you know infill type developments and and maybe a reversal of the of the sprawl that we've seen in the past, um, which is so evident when you're flying <laughs> flying into uh, into Atlanta, uh, and I think that's a, that's a really you know, provides an opportunity. I mean we've seen big a number of, of large businesses either moving into downtown Atlanta or moving in from the suburbs um, and into the downtown area. Uh, so I think that provides some really promising opportunities and it's fueling things um, you know, like the Atlanta Beltline, um, which is perhaps an example of not starting small, but starting really with a broad, you know, with a bold vision and, um, and, and the people behind that. You know, went out and campaigned for it. They held lots of lots and lots of community meetings, and built a, a broad um, groundswell of support that finally got politicians on board. So, I think those are some. Uh, and that has co-benefits. You know, it's economic development, it's connectivity, it's green space, um, all those things. Thanks, John. Yeah, if I could make a, a quick comment on that, just uh, another example. Chattanooga, uh, Tennessee, is famous for turning their basically their uh, uh, terrible pollution problems around to being an asset, cleaning up the, the riverfront, and uh, you know basically developing quality quality of life and quality of environment as an attractor. So they they've been very effective at uh, bringing businesses in, and I heard the mayor of. Uh, uh, Chattanooga at one point uh, a few years ago said that there was a major uh, company, I forget which company it was, it wasn't VW, which also is, is located in North American headquarters there, but they, they said that they would locate in their city on one condition, it was on the river, if the city extended the Greenway Trail that didn't go all the way to the site up to their site so their employees could use it. So the mayor says, sold, we'll do it. And that was their condition. They were attracted by, uh, you know, basically by a Greenway resource, the quality That's of life. That's a great example. Yeah. And 
and we did hear that throughout the interviews with the sort of quality of life that people are starting to see that that benefit of it as um, potential for economic develop, development, business attraction, companies want places where employees want to live. And so if you look at a Greenway as both a sort of environmental resource but also a, a quality of life benefit that can have that economic benefit of attracting, you know, businesses that want to be in places where people want to live, um, it's that multi-benefit approach. Sure, and then maybe that's that's one of those key opportunities for urban conservation, for urban planning professionals and conservation professionals to come together around a, a regional strategy like the Blueprint to help identify those places where a greenway could make the biggest contributions to the persistence of the natural and cultural resources that we care about, and that the greenway design and implementation strategies really maximize the environmental benefits as well um, as those quality of life and livability co-benefits. Anybody else want to jump in before we wrap up the discussion? I just have a couple quick updates and a preview of next month's web forum before we sign off at 11. This is, this is John Fassini again. I just had uh, one question or, or, or um, about the about the the interviews and and um, I guess it would be I think it would be helpful to uh, at least and I'm sure there will be that information in the final report but uh, to see more of you know how representative was this set of interviews where, where you know what kind of cross section uh, of the community do they do they represent where, you know how many of the planners you know are uh, were they you know how many are from where are they from what kind of organization are they from same thing with the conservationists just to get a sense of um, of, of how, to, how to interpret this. Yeah, we'll certainly provide that as part of, you know, a part of our, our, our um, you know, materials. And I guess we'll, will we do that for the summit next week? Mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah, we'll provide that. You know, obviously there are a lot of the mega region multi-states, so there are a lot of planners and a lot of uh, conservation professionals. But so we can't say if it's an exhaustive sample, but uh, sampling, but it was like very key people. I think some very, we hit some, you know, some key jurisdictions, some representatives of different types of planning communities. Uh, uh, I think there is a- It was a little bit weighted towards North Carolina yeah. on the planning side, um, but we did, again, talk to people in North Carolina, um, South Carolina, uh, Florida, and Georgia. Yeah. Cool. Great, good question. All right, well, I'm going to um, end things there for discussion and, and take the presenter power back here and just wrap up with some, um, with some staff updates. The main update here from the South Atlantic staff is just that, um, if you haven't heard already, Blueprint 2.1 was officially released last month. Um, so it's currently available on the Conservation Planning Atlas. We're working on pulling it into the simple viewer. So please go check out the Blueprint 2.1 data gallery. You can get access there to the Blueprint itself as well as all the underlying spatial data like the ecosystem integrity scores and the corridor analysis. Um, and just like Blueprint 2.0, this is a data-driven blueprint. It's based on ecosystem integrity and connectivity, and it uses very similar methods uh, as 2.0 did, but it's incorporating improved data for many of the indicators, particularly in the freshwater aquatic environment and the marine environment, as well as relevant to this webinar, improvements to the urban open space index that's looking at the uh, access that urban residents have to open space in their communities. And I didn't make a slide on this, but I, I do think it's worth mentioning that the summit, this Urban Conservation Summit in Atlanta, has come up a couple times, and um, that was really intended to be a small invite-only kind of event. We do have some slots still open, so if anybody is on this webinar and thinks they might be able to get down to Atlanta and interested in participating in that event next week, um, please email me, Hillary underscore Morris at fws.gov, and, and we'll see if we can't uh, make those arrangements. Uh, so just wrapping up with the preview of next month's third Thursday web forum. That'll be October 20th, uh, same time, same connection info as today. And we'll be hearing from Rua, who's, of course, the South Atlantic LCC Science Coordinator. Uh, he'll be updating us on some work that the South Atlantic LCC has been doing in collaboration with the U.S. Forest Service and some of their hydrologists with the goal of predicting increased water availability resulting from longleaf pine management. So this is part of a larger effort to make proposals to national programs from the South Atlantic region more competitive, um, since more and more national programs that fund 
things like land protection, restoration, management are including water-related impacts in their scoring criteria, uh, being able to predict the millions of gallons of water per day that are saved as the result um, of these proposals from the South Atlantic could help make them more competitive and, and ultimately put more conservation on the ground. So this is also part of uh, your cooperative's ongoing work to link conservation actions to the South Atlantic indicators uh, so that we're able to quantify improvements to ecosystem condition that result from, for example, land protection or from prescribed fire. So Ru is going to be sharing a progress update on this work and go over some next steps and, as always, provide an opportunity for feedback. So if you're interested in longleaf uh, pine management, definitely encourage you to tune in next month. And then, as always, I want to make sure folks know how they can get more involved. Uh, please talk to your staff members, talk to other folks involved in the cooperative. And I'd also really encourage you to join the South Atlantic LCC web community. This is how you'll get signed up for our monthly newsletter, as well as a reminder about this web forum. Um, so uh, that's really all I have today. Um, Please feel free to ask any questions that you might have before we sign off. Um, don't be shy. Well, thank you so much to uh, David Rouse, Jennifer Hennigan, and Anna Reed from the American Planning Association for their great presentation today. And I really appreciate everyone who attended. It's 10.59, so um, I'll end things here and hope that you join us next month. Thank you, Hillary. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.